The Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions uh, will come to order as I think uh, my colleagues um, up here on the dais know that the original purpose of this hearing was twofold. Uh, uh, the first part was to uh, issue a subpoena to Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, to ask him why uh, he thought his company could violate labor law, federal labor law, with impunity. Uh, the NLRB has issued over 80 complaints against Starbucks, uh, which the company has ignored. Uh, but I'm happy to say that yesterday, um, the day before this vote, uh, Mr. Schultz uh, and Starbucks decided that he would appear and we will have a discussion with him on the 29th of March. Uh, but the other half of what this meeting was about is what we're gonna have right now, and it is uh, an enormously important meeting, and I'm very, very delighted that we have uh, five wonderful witnesses, and I wanna say a special thanks to Liz Schiller, the head of the AFL-CIO, and Mary Kay Henry and Sean O'Brien, of the Teamsters, these folks are not only here today, they have spent their lives fighting for working people, and we very much appreciate all that you have done to improve lives for millions of Americans. Uh, the issue that we're debating today deals with the reality that everybody in America understands that we're living in a very strange and unfair economy. On one hand, in the richest country in the history of the world, we have over 60% of our people living paycheck to paycheck. That means people who worry that if their car breaks down, if their kid gets sick, if their landlord raises their rent, they're suddenly gonna find themselves in a real financial crisis. In America today, from coast to coast, we have people by the millions working for starvation wages. Right now, the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. Obviously, many states have gone beyond that. But despite that, you got millions of people who are working for totally inadequate wages. And this committee, by the way, must do everything possible to raise that minimum wage to a living wage. In America today, we are seeing levels of income and wealth inequality that have never been seen in the history of the United States of America. Today, you got three people on top who are more wealth than the bottom half of American society. You got the top 1%, only more wealth than the bottom 92%. You have almost all new income and wealth being created going to the people on top. You're looking at corporate profits in company after company at record breaking levels. Guys making billions of dollars a year, your CEO compensation right now, 400 times more than the average American worker. And the American people look around them, what do they see? They see the very rich becoming richer, and in many cases, they are falling further and further behind. They can't afford health care, can't afford child care, can't afford to take care of their parents. And a lot of reasons for why that's happened. It's not the fault of the Republican Party, it's not the fault of the Democratic Party, it's a lot of factors that are out there. But today, and if this committee is gonna do its job, we're gonna stand with working people 
and do everything that we can to create an economy that works for all of us and not just the few. And anyone who knows anything about history understands that one way, one important way, that workers, and I come from a working class, proudly a working class family, one way that workers have been able to lift themselves up is by joining unions and engaging in collective bargaining for decent wages and decent benefits. That is one important way that workers have been able to uplift themselves. I want to congratulate our union leaders here today for helping millions of workers do just that. But what we are seeing right now at this moment in history is despite the fact that the billionaire class have never done better, corporate profits are soaring, we are seeing these very same corporations, and it's not just Starbucks, believe me, pour hundreds of millions of dollars in efforts to make it impossible for workers to exercise their constitutional rights, constitutional rights to form a union. You can be pro-union, you can be anti-union. But what we have got to establish today is that workers have the constitutional right to form a union. And what we're seeing in company after company after company, people who want to join unions being fired, we're seeing workers being taken into back rooms and being lectured about how terrible unions are, we're seeing people being intimidated. That is not what is supposed to be happening in America. So the message for me, at least, that's going to go out today is that we are a nation of law and that even if you are a multi-billion dollar corporation with all kinds of consultants and accountants, you know what? You are going to obey the law. And in this country, workers have the right to form unions. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure that they can exercise that constitutional right. Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, excuse me. Obey the law. That is not an issue. And let's also table set. The, 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 the chair's opening statement spoke about how 60, 60 million or 60 percent of the population is living paycheck to paycheck. Prior to this administration and the Biden inflation that has gone up 14 percent since he took office, people had money in their checking account. People had money in their savings account. But with that Biden inflation, now people, and you can look at the statistics, the savings among the lower quintile have been depleted with this Biden inflation. Now, I think we need to table set, and if we're going to say, oh my gosh, it is the fault of X, Y, and Z, I think we really need to know exactly where that fault lies. Now. Let's talk about the issue of the day. There are 76,000 union workers in Louisiana. Being a right to work state means that these workers have the right and they choose to be in a union. And I am supporting that choice. They choose. And in America, you have a choice. That's what being a right to work state is about. Now the majority's title and the framing of today's hearing is that you're defending the right of workers to organize leaves out an important other side of the coin. Defending the right of a worker also includes defending those who choose that it is not their best interest to join a union. They may decide that a union limits their work flexibility, eliminates their ability to be rewarded, uh, or uh, based upon that their advancement is based upon individual talent and merit and not and not seniority. Maybe they just don't want a certain amount of their paycheck going to pay union leaders' salaries, and maybe they don't want a certain amount to disproportionately go to political candidates for whom they do not vote. And I am told that by people who choose not to be in unions. Now, let's not confuse being pro-union with being pro-worker. Being pro-worker means supporting all workers and all workers' rights and their ability to choose for themselves what is their best path forward for them and for their family. We're seeing a concerning trend that attempts to erode workers' rights. It might be administrative action, by rule, if you will, or it might be the introduction of the PRO Act. These efforts are not about supporting the rights of workers. Their intent is to force workers into unions to prop up and support big, politically connected unions. Yesterday, I sent a letter to the National Labor Relations Board concerning the weaponization of its enforcement power and the targeting of high-profile employers on behalf of these same well-connected unions. 
the purpose of the NLRB by law, and this is about obeying the law, the purpose of the NLRB by law is to provide an unbiased framework to review disputes between employees and employers. That's not what we're seeing. Last week, a Michigan court denied an NLRB request for a nationwide cease and desist order in Kerwin versus Starbucks because NLRB did not have sufficient evidence supporting a claim against the employer. Let's repeat. NLRB claimed a company was employing a nationwide anti-union policy, and by the way, the title of this hearing presumes guilt. It echoes their claim, but their claim lacks sufficient evidence to justify the accusation. What is really concerning about the NLRB hearing is that a hearing officer recently substantiated voting irregularities at a Starbucks in Kansas that could potentially elevate the misconduct on the behalf of the NRL, NRLB employees. This includes NRLB providing duplicate ballots, supplying union organizers with confidential voter information, and providing voter accommodations to employees selected by the union without offering them to all employees. These actions are in direct violation of federal law and NRLB written guidelines. By the way, I'm not here to represent a particular company. No one is above our nation's laws, and that includes the NLRB. Today we'll hear a lot about the PRO Act. To make one thing clear, PRO Act is not pro worker, it's pro big union. It gets rid of the secret ballot elections for unionization, which is the gold standard to keep somebody from being put into a corner and intimidated until they vote the way that the intimidator wishes them to vote. It protects them from retaliation if it goes in a different way. The Pro, Worker, the Pro Act would make workers in my home state of Louisiana and 27 other states uh, vulnerable to force unionization. Um, if they want to unionize, I'm for them. Let's do it. It is a constitutional right, and we should give it to them. Um, but if they choose not to, they shouldn't be coerced, and they shouldn't be coerced in having a portion of their paycheck taken to go to union activities of which they do not approve. By the workers, by the way, if workers don't have a choice of whether to join, then the union has no, no longer has an obligation to respond to the views of those whom they represent. And I do think this might be related to the disconnect between what we've seen between the political positions of union members and the political positions taken by their leadership. I ask my colleagues that we not conflate pro-union with pro-worker. We must support all workers, those who want to be in a union and those who do not wish to be. With that, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Thank you very much, Senator Cassidy. Uh, Liz Schuller is the president of the AFL-CIO which represents more than 12 million members uh, in 60 different unions. President Schuler is the daughter of a union lineman and got a start as an organizer at IBEW Local 125. Uh, and she is a strong fighter for workers' rights and we're proud that she's with us today. Ms. Schuller. Thank you so much, Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the HELP Committee. Thank you for holding this hearing today and for inviting me to testify. Uh, as was said, I'm the president of the AFL-CIO. Uh, we are an umbrella, a federation of 60 unions, 12 and a half million working people all across this country, uh, in every industry, in every state, from actors and athletes, to bus drivers and electricians, to nurses, scientists, video game developers, and everything in between. And I would like to say, as a, as a woman leader, we're the largest organization of working women in the country. Not a lot of people think of us that way. Um, we want all working people in this country that want to, to be able to exercise their legal right to join or form a union. It's that simple. Because we've seen throughout America's history, unions get results. If you enjoy the weekend, anyone enjoy the weekend? You can thank the labor movement for the weekend. Uh, if you get overtime pay, unions got it done. Unions are the single most powerful tool we have to demand fair, just, and equitable treatment of workers. Yet, at this moment, the very fight to form a union is under attack. It's under attack from corporations that made billions in record profits last year, but refused to pay their employees enough to afford rent 
or groceries. It's under attack from CEOs who have yachts so big they need bridges in ports to be modified, but balk at providing workers in their factories with bathroom breaks. These corporations and executives can buy many things. We cannot let them buy the basic rights of working people. And so today I'm here to bring the voices of workers in this room, and many of whom are in the audience. In 2022, corporations like Starbucks, like Delta Airlines, Alphabet, and Apple posted some of their most profitable years in history. What do workers have to show for it? Well, while pay for corporate CEOs increased over 1,000% between 1978 and 2019, worker pay rose 13.7% over that 40-plus year uh, time frame. It's no coincidence that labor standards have plummeted as the percentage of people in unions has declined in America. Workers face unpredictable schedules, understaffed and unsafe workplaces, and a lack of basic dignity on the job. Unions are the counterweight. We balance the scales. The data is overwhelming. Workplaces with unions provide more predictable schedules, safer workplaces, better benefits. And a recent study showed if union density had not declined over the past few decades, the typical worker today would earn $3,250 more per year. Okay, so I just want to ask every working person watching this a simple question. What would your family do with an extra $3,250 per year? You can imagine. But change is in the air. Workers are energized. They're forming unions in new industries in places we never thought possible. They're connecting the dots. They're forming unions and they're seeing that that's how progress happens. The response of companies like Starbucks, the same ones that hide behind progressive values, call their workers partners, has been to turn around and throw a litany of dirty tactics at these employees. And I have to say I'm so glad that Mr. Schultz has decided to present himself in front of this committee. Um, how many hundreds of thousands of baristas showed up every day for Starbucks in the middle of a pandemic? How many of those workers helped him make vast sums of money? It's the least he can do to show up here and talk about an issue that is so important to their lives. And across this country, employers spend $340 million per year on law firms and consultants to help them intimidate workers. They fire union activists. They hold mandatory anti-union meetings. And somehow the money that companies like Amazon spend on these consultants is not only legal, but it's a tax write-off. It doesn't have to be this way. Some employers like Microsoft, everyone familiar with Microsoft, they have said, you know what? If our workers want to join a union, we should let that happen. We shouldn't stand in the way. So the company pledged neutrality with the Communications Workers of America. This is the path forward. Moving together forward in partnership, everyone wins. But this isn't the norm. We need a level playing field. We need to pass the Richard L. Trumka Protecting the Right to Organize Act as soon as possible, to protect collective action, to remove the barriers to worker voice, and hold employers accountable when they violate workers' rights. We need to provide the NLRB with the funding that it needs to enforce the law and protect workers and hold CEOs accountable for their actions so that every worker has the simple right to choose for themselves whether a union makes sense, as the senator said. These are not radical ideas. These are simple steps to ensure fairness. And if we fix our broken system, I guarantee you working people will keep coming together in greater and greater numbers, and our movement will continue to grow and fight for the issues, issues that matter not only to union members, but millions of workers across this country. Thank you. President Shula, thanks very much. Uh, Mary Kay Henry is the international president of the two million member uh, service employees international union, SEIU. President Henry has been a champion for fast food service and health care workers for decades, most notably leading the fight for a $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, President Henry, thanks for being with us. 
Thank you, Chairman Sanders, and thank you, Ranking Member Cassidy and members of this committee for holding this hearing. I'm honored to be here today as the international president of the Service Employees International Union, representing the two million members who work across the service and care sectors. This hearing is both urgent and timely because the deck is stacked against working families all across this nation. Take the example of Crystal Orozco, a California fast food worker who's been in the industry for 15 years. When Crystal demanded COVID safety protections for herself and her coworkers, her managers threatened to cut her hours. When Crystal and her coworkers began organizing together in a union, they faced intimidation and opposition from their employer. When Crystal and her coworkers won a historic seat at a table for a half a million fast food workers in California, fast food corporations pooled their resources to put a landmark state labor law on hold and potentially overturn it. Crystal's experience is all too common for workers in every part of our economy across industries worked by SEIU members, workers in the fight for 15 and a union, and partners with Starbucks Workers United. That's why working people are demanding a voice on the job through their unions, and they're calling on each and every one of you to reimagine an economy that works for all of us, not just for billionaires and corporations. Workers are coming up with new and creative, bold ways to organize together across industries, sectors, and geographies, because they know the only way to counter corporate control is through collective worker power. And it's not just one or two industries. It's spreading like wildfire. It's spreading to Starbucks partners at over 300 stores, gig workers across the rideshare sector, and service and care workers in the South. Airport service workers from coast to coast, championed by Senator Markey with the Good Jobs for Good Airports Act. Home care providers, championed by Senator Casey with the Better Care for Better Jobs Act. Child care workers, championed by Senator Murray with the Child Care for Working Families Act. And with the support of the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, championed by Senator Sanders. All of these workers and their champions in this room have put forth bold proposals that together lift up millions of working people. But even with the support for workers and their unions at an all-time high, workers are hitting a wall built by the wealthy and the powerful. Worker corporations have rigged the rules of our economy against working people to maximize their own profits. They're pulling out all the stops against the very workers that power their profits. They're exploiting workers, union busting, and retaliating against union organizing. They're bullying workers, plain and simple. And often, it's illegal. Union busting is a big business. McDonald's, Amazon, American Airlines, HCA Healthcare, and Starbucks are willing to spend hundreds of millions to keep union busting booming. Just look at Howard Schultz, who until yesterday, under the threat of a subpoena vote, refused to testify before this committee. Under Schultz's leadership, Starbucks continues to repeatedly and shamelessly stand in the way of partners who are demanding a voice in their workplace and a strong contract to build a better future. It's ridiculous that the future of tens of thousands of Starbucks workers is up to the whims of just one person, Howard Schultz, who continues to oversee a company that breaks the law without sufficient consequence. And it's not just Starbucks. Workers are routinely met with vicious union busting campaigns. Corporations break the law or strategically refuse to reach a first contract without facing any penalties. Federal labor law still contains racist and sexist exclusions rooted in Jim Crow. We need to write new rules that protect all workers, black, brown, and white, to ensure that we can all thrive. And it's time for elected officials to heed workers' demands. 
That starts with the federal minimum wage of at least $15, investment in good union care jobs, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, the Good Jobs for Good Airports Act, the Better Care, Better Jobs Act, and the Child Care for Working Families Act, and measures that can make it easier for working people to join together in unions. Workers' demands are big and bold, and they're necessary to rebalance the scales of our economy. History shows that sometimes the only way to rewrite the rules is through great disruption, militancy, and strikes. Nothing is off the table because our future, the future of America's working families, is at stake. We will not stop fighting until we win. Thank you. President Henry, thank you very much. Uh, Sean O'Brien is the general president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and a fourth generation Teamster since his election uh, last year. He has been all over this country urging workers to stand up and fight for their rights. President O'Brien, thanks so much for being with us. Good morning, Chairman Sanders, <clears throat> ranking member Cassidy, distinguished members of the committee, and my union sisters, President Schuler and Henry. My name is Sean O'Brien. I'm the general president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today before you. It's important the American public knows that their elected officials care about regular people and not just billion dollar corporations. For that reason, I'm encouraged that this committee has compelled Howard Schultz to appear as a witness. The last time I testified in 2022, Senator Lindsey Graham said workers in the U.S. didn't want to belong to unions anymore. In reality, the opposite is true. The percentage of American workers who support unions is at an all-time high. But they're unable to join unions, form unions, or get a first contract because in America, the game is rigged. Our nation's labor laws are weak, ineffectual, and unenforced. Look at Starbucks. Almost 300 Starbucks locations have voted to unionize, but the company and Howard Schultz refuse to come to the bargaining table. These workers want a union at 300 stores. Howard Schultz has said there will never be a union at Starbucks. He stated his intentions clearly. He has closed unionized Starbucks locations. He has threatened workers in their benefits. As a result, there have been more than 500 unfair labor practice charges filed against Starbucks. But sadly, those ULPs do nothing to stop Schultz's illegal behavior. Why? Because there are no meaningful consequences for businesses and CEOs like Howard Schultz when they break our laws. Instead of supporting legislation to protect a worker's choice to join a union, half the Senators on this committee are only willing to offer right-to-work laws. These deceptive laws create the ability to leave a union while still reaping all the benefits and belonging to one. We have the data on the right-to-work. These laws lower wages, create substandard benefits, and erode workers' rights in every state where they are passed. These laws never benefit working people, only big business. That's why the Koch brothers and Walmart have always been the biggest donors to the National Right to Work Foundation. I've spent the last three years traveling this nation, visiting hundreds of warehouses, loading docks, and job sites, and listening to real union members. Teams as our conservatives and progressives. Some are laser fo focused on politics, and some stay out of it altogether. Our members love their union for one simple fact. They get more money and better benefits because they are Teamsters. It's not complicated. Even non-union workers in right-to-work states make more money because of Teamsters. The data proves it. Going to work without union representation is like defending yourself in court with no lawyer on your side. Why would a politician, Republican or otherwise, advocate for any American worker to be in that position? I know why Walmart would, but why would somebody sworn to represent the people want workers to be more vulnerable and exploited? Just a couple of months ago, Teamster Rail members were telling every one of you that working conditions were bad with these major rail carriers. These workers felt vulnerable. Safety concerns were ignored. The companies were understaffed. The, the trains ran too long, and railroaders were overworked. Nobody cared until it was too late. This kind of behavior is where the term getting railroaded comes from. From 100 years ago, when the railroads always got their way, when any employer be the rail carriers, package companies, or coffee shops, gets away with repeated abuse of American workers, the legislatures who let it happen are complicit in these crimes. The Teamsters' biggest employer is UPS. 
We have a contract coming up with the national negotiations set to start in a few weeks. This is the largest private sector collective bargaining agreement representing 360,000 workers. UPS's biggest competitors are FedEx and Amazon. This may come as news to some committee members, but companies that threaten their workers and violate their rights are not interested in investing in their workforce and they are not creating good jobs. Amazon's whole business model is about avoiding responsibility for their workers. They have a 150% turnover ratio. A Teamster package car driver at UPS makes twice what the same driver makes at Amazon and FedEx, twice as much. Why is that? It's because a driver at UPS is a Teamster. We get twice as much because we are union. And remember, UPS still made more money and profits these past three years than it ever has made in history. Do the members of this committee want American workers to make more or less? This summer, I promise you the Teamsters at UPS and the negotiating committee will negotiate the strongest private sector collective bargaining agreement in the country. It will set the standard for what a good union job in America should be. And all of America will be watching as the Teamsters take on Carol Tomei and UPS. We are at a critical moment. Workers are drawing a line while conservative court chip away at the constitutionally protected right to organize. So I ask the members of this committee, especially those who co-sponsored Senator Paul's right to work bill, whose side will you be on? Thank you. President O'Brien, thanks very much. Uh, Senator Cassidy, you, you want to introduce your witnesses? Sure. Uh, welcome all our witnesses, but I will first introduce Mr. Ring. Mr. Ring is a former chairman of the NLRB and an expert in the field of labor and employment. Mr. Uh, Law, Mr. Ring was confirmed to the NLRB on April the 11, 2018, and served as chair until January 2021, and then as a board member till the end of his term in December 2022. He led efforts to streamline the NLRB's case handling procedures, reducing backlog to historic low. He holds a BA from Catholic University and a JD from Catholic University's Columbus School of Law. Uh, Chairman Ring, we welcome your presence and expertise. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Chairman Sanders, uh, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee, thank you for your invitation to participate in the hearing today. It's an honor to appear before you. Um, Senator Cassidy said, I am a partner at the law firm of Morgan Lewis, where I practiced labor law for almost 30 years before serving on the National Labor Relations Board. I, I recently returned to Morgan Lewis following my service. Um, as I noted during my confirmation hearing in front of this committee almost five years ago, my career in the field, labor field started at the Teamsters Washington DC headquarters um, where I worked for nearly seven years during college and law school. Um, that experience offered an important perspective that shaped my law practice, gave me tremendous respect for the collective bargaining process and informed my overall approach to labor law. As this committee looks at the state of union organizing, I know that there are many who think that the PRO Act is a panacea and that corporate America is the problem. I would urge Congress, particularly this committee, not to turn its back on the National Labor Relations Act quite yet. Instead, Congress should consider whether the problems the PRO Act is supposed to fix can be addressed short of a major rewrite in federal labor law. After my recent service on the NLRB, I'm convinced that some common sense modifications to at least three aspects of the NLRB's current enforcement approach would accomplish a great deal. First and foremost, the NLRB must process its cases more quickly. Parties, employees, unions, and employers should not have to wait years to get their cases resolved. The, 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 it is simply justice denied for employees to wait multiple years for a union election or to wait to be reinstated following an unfair labor practice. The delays are so bad that the PRO Act seeks to establish an NLRB workaround, creating a dual track for a private right of action for labor violations. The good news from my perspective is that this is all fixable. One of the accomplishments that I'm most proud of from my time as NLRB, uh, NLRB chairman was the work we did to reduce case processing time when I arrived at the NLRB in 2018, there were cases that had been pending for almost 10 years, and many were three to five years old. By making modest 
process management improvements, we were able to reduce the median age of cases pending before the board from 233 days in fiscal 2018 to 85 days at the end of 2000, uh, fiscal 2020. So it can be done. For the second enforcement change that I'd like to recommend, that the board must return to its focus of, and focus on its core miss mission. That is overseeing union organizing and collective bargaining. In recent years, the board has embarked on a series of ill-fated efforts to test the boundaries of its statutory authority that has wasted countless resources, clogged the board's docket, and, diverse, and, and, and diverted the, and the agency's attention from its core mission. Several years ago, for example, the NLRB decided that it, was, it would challenge mandatory arbitration agreements. After years of litigation and hundreds of charges, the board was resoundingly rebuffed by the Supreme Court. And the board has pushed other of these wasteful forays in an attempt to expand the act's protections, from policing employer handbooks to just recently deciding to prohibit standard provisions in all employers' severance agreements. These various initiatives have little to do with, with unionization or collective bargaining. Unfortunately, while pursuing all these initiatives, the board fails those who need it the most. Last month, amid a, the board's recent renewed activity to expand protections again on these various non-core issues, the board finally issued an election for 86 mechanics at a Nissan plant in Mississippi after two years. The machinist union statement after the decision lamented, quote, a broken and painstakingly slow NLRB process, close quote. Finally, the NLRB needs to uh, end the destructive practice of policy and precedent oscillation. When I was chairman, we worked to restore much of the decades old precedent that had been upended by the board before us. The current board is determined, it appears, to swing the pendulum even further. These swings in, pen in precedent make it difficult for anyone to know the rules and, into, and it undermines respect for the board. Industrial peace is best served when everyone knows what the rules are and has comp they have confidence in the board to enforce those rules in a neutral and consistent manner. In closing, I'd say that rather than rewrite federal labor law, Congress should consider these necessary NLRB enforcement changes. Not only are they eminently doable, these changes avoid the PRO Act's sweeping and far-ranging impacts, particularly on employee free choice, basic democratic rights to a secret election, and free debate. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Mr. Mix, uh, I get to introduce you, sir. Uh, Mark Mix is the president of the Right to Work Committee and the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation, a position he has held since 2003. For decades, um, Mr. Mix has been a stalwart defender of workers' rights and independence, providing legal assistance and protection for workers against abuses of forced unionization. Mr. Mix holds a BA from James Madison University. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Senator Sanders, for the opportunity to appear here, Senator Cassidy and other members of the Senate. Uh, I am Mark Mix. I've uh, been the president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation for 20 years and the National Right to Work Committee for 20 years. I've been working in the right to work movement for 36 years. Grew up in a small town with more cows than people. My stepfather was a International Association machinist member uh, for 32 years. Um, grew up in a union household in a union environment in America, and it wasn't until I understood what labor law looks like as it compels workers going back to the 1930s uh, to join and associate with an organization. Senator Sanders, you talked about constitutional rights and the constitutional right to organize. I mean, surely you, you're talking about the NAACP versus Alabama case in 1958 where the First Amendment was basically defined as being the right to associate, but also the right not to associate. And yet labor law, written back in 1935, talks about all of these flowery things, but in Section 7 of the Act, it says that workers have all these rights, and they have the right to refrain, and if there had been a period at that moment, we probably wouldn't be here today, because that would have given workers the choice under the National Labor Relations Act to refrain from union activity. But it didn't. It went on except to the extent that a worker can be con compelled to pay dues or fees or join a union at that time in order to work or get or keep a job. So the constitutional right comes with the right to associate versus, and so it presupposes the right not to associate. But yet labor policy and the policies that are pushed by, unfortunately, the National Labor Relations Board and legislative bodies across the country continue to rely on force as opposed to volunteerism. 
And you know, it's an interesting story when you think about the, the origins of the union and Samuel Gompers, the founder of the AFL. In his final speech in El Paso, Texas in 1924, when you were getting ready to come to Congress in 1926 for the Railway Labor Act and imposing the federal imposition of unionization on railway employees across the country, Gompers gave his final speech saying, the workers of America adhere to voluntary institutions. Anything else, using force, will destroy that which together through volunteerism is invincible. And what Gompers' message was was very clear, and it's to the, the union officials down the row here on the table, that you have a great product. Go sell that product. Don't rely on government to give you the force to compel people to join unions. And that's exactly what happens in the American workplace today, whether it be at the National Labor Relations Board ignoring the ideas and the views of, of literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees. At the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation, we've had the privilege of representing hundreds of thousands of employees in litigation against employers and unions. When employers violate workers' rights, we go after them. When unions violate workers' rights, we go after them. The idea of individual freedom and choice is a fundamental principle of who we are as a country, yet labor law destroys that fundamental voluntarism and independence that most workers enjoy. So I'm here today, um, you know, Senator Sanders, you talked about one way to realize the American dream is to join a union. There are lots of other ways and there are lots of other examples of that. And frankly today, 94% of the workers in the private sector in America today are not part of a union and not members of unions. Many of them would like to be and you've heard uh, President O'Brien talk about the, the high rate of favorability of labor unions. Absolutely, labor unions are being considered as favorable by the American public. But the other question in that Gallup poll that he cites was not referenced in the media, and that asked those non-union employees that were surveyed whether they had any interest in joining a union. 58% said they had no interest in joining a union. 11% said, yeah, they are very interested. And in the medium, in the, in the middle there were peaks that said, well, I don't really know or I don't care. So the idea of giving a, a private organization the ability to compel someone to pay union dues or fees as a condition of getting or keeping a job is the wrong policy, not only for organized labor, but the wrong policy for America. Giving workers a choice whether or not they want to associate, but yet the labor policy of this country, once a majority of those voting in a workplace, can combine, can bind and compel people to associate with a labor union. You know, in regular business law, we know the elements of a contract include, you know, a meeting of the minds. It means no direct it means it must be legal and there must be consideration. Labor law in America today and since 1935 has stood that basic agency relationship on its head by allowing a private organization to compel workers to associate with them and accept their representation, even though they didn't ask for it, didn't want it, and, and may not even be interested in it because it hurts them. You know, there are lots of, lots of opportunities to explain how a union collective bargaining agreement can hurt the very worker that it claims to represent. And union officials here don't ever recognize that. Somehow they know better than any individual worker in the workplace about what's right or wrong for them. I disagree with that. The right to work principle is a very simple principle. I would encourage you to support Senator Paul's bill, Senate Bill 532, that doesn't add a single word to federal law, not one. It simply goes back into that antiquated labor policy of the 1930s and removes compulsion and makes the bias of this government in favor of voluntary unionism. I think that's a good policy for America, and I think most American workers do as well. Mr. Mix, thank you very much. In America today, we are seeing large corporations and their consultants spend hundreds of billions of dollars trying to prevent workers from, in fact, joining unions. Let me ask uh, Ms. Schuller, Ms. Henry, or Mr. O'Brien, why do you think these large corporations, often with CEOs like Schultz, who are billionaires, are spending so much money trying to make it impossible for workers to join union. Sean, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, so, I mean, it's no secret that it's a $350 million. Uh, your, uh, it's a $350 million per year business. Um, look, I think it's clear, especially when you're dealing with the CEO of Amazon and Starbucks that, you know, these, these CEOs and these corporations, all they care about is the bottom line of a balance sheet. And if there's any threat to that bottom line of a balance sheet or accountability, meaning that workers are being represented, workers are being uh, uh, compensated and represented clearly by unions, um, that's why there's such a big threat. You know, my colleague 
uh, on the end, Mr. Ring makes, makes a point saying, you know, everybody's got a right to choose whether they want to belong to a union. Let's look at Starbucks. You have 300 locations that voted to join a union, and yet, you know, you, you have these, you know, union-busting firms spending $350 million a year. Look, we did exactly what you fight for, right? We voted. Those workers voted to join a union. The company should be held accountable and sat down and made to negotiate an agreement. Why? Let me, let me just jump in and uh, ask Ms. Schiller or Ms. Henry. Why would workers want to join a union? I mean, do they do better? Give me some statistics here about how union workers are doing compared to non-union workers. And it relates to your last question, too, that um, workers fundamentally want a voice. They want a seat at the table. Um, and I think that someone like Howard Schultz misunderstands what unions are. Uh, there's this idea of, oh, this is going to hurt my business, and oh, this is going to uh, restrain me from making decisions that I want to make. It's absolutely not the case. What it does do is increase productivity. It increases longevity and predictability uh, for your business because when workers are satisfied and they feel like they have a seat at the table, they're heard, um, they make you know, better wages and, and have health care benefits, they're going to be more productive employees and make your business do better. We all want to win here, right? And I think there's a misunderstanding that unions want to see businesses fail. That is absolutely not the case because when businesses fail, we don't have jobs, right? Uh, so, but yes, the statistics are very clear, Senator, that, um, you know, working people have, um, I think it's almost 15% uh, more wages when you uh, join a union, uh, particularly for women and people of color. Uh, that adds up over to a lifetime, not to mention the, uh, using health, uh, having health care benefits, retirement security. Um, let me ask, Ms. Henry, uh, SEIU I know has been very active in trying to organize low-wage workers in the fast food industry, the service industry. What does it mean to a worker who's making starvation wages when they're able to join a union? Uh, it means a shot at a better life uh, for themselves and their children. Uh, it means that uh, I don't have to be subjected to sexual harassment or race discrimination on the job because I need this job in order to pay my rent or pay my groceries. It means that um, I might be able to dream that it's possible for my child to do better than I've done if I'm able to join together in a union and end the starvation wages that you talked about at the beginning of this hearing and get on a path to living wages with benefits that create some stability in people's lives where they can make plans for the future. Let me ask, to go back to Sean. Uh, your members, workers all over this country, see billionaires becoming much richer while they often want cutbacks in health care or wages, wage increases that are not keeping up with inflation. How do workers feel about this huge increase in income and wealth inequality and the greed that we're seeing on the part of corporate America? Well, I can tell you, um, my members, 1.3 million members nationwide, um, they provided goods and services to this country probably in the toughest times through the pandemic with total disregard for their safety and the safety of their families when they were going home. They were going out providing parcel delivery, providing food distribution, providing rubbish pickup, providing every essential service that we may take for granted at times. And all the while, all these big corporations like UPS, uh, Republic Waste, you know, Kroger's grocery warehouses, they were making record profits while our members, in some cases, were losing their jobs. And losing their lives. Losing their lives. Um, and not gaining in some of these profits that, you know, these businesses and these corporations, uh, which my members feel today, that they were taken advantage of. And I think there's a lot of workers, not only unionized workers, but non-union workers that feel the same way, you know, especially in light of what we just came out of. Let me, my, I've gone over my time, and I'll give Senator Cassidy equal time, but my last question do we have any statistics about how many thousands of workers died during the pandemic keeping the economy going while the billionaire class became richer? Do we have any numbers on that? 
Uh, I can tell you that in the healthcare sector in this country, we're still trying to get the data, Senator, but it is criminal what happened in our nation's nursing homes and hospitals in the beginning of the pandemic when we were not getting personal protective equipment that we needed in our nation's nursing homes for both the caregivers and for the residents. It is fair to say thousands of workers died on Oh, yes. Many thousands. Yes. Okay, I've gone over my time. Senator Cassidy. Uh, I'm going to defer to Senator Mark Wayne Mullen. Thank you, Ranking Member. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. And I, I want to make a, a very clear, I'm not against unions. I'm not at all. Uh, some of my very good friends work for unions. Uh, they work hard and they do a good job. Um, and so my statements, please don't make uh, an assumption that I'm anti-union. But I also want to set the record straight. All three of you guys have talked about employers being intimidated, intimidating their employees. But you guys haven't ever spoke about when the unions try to unionize, the intimidation they have to other people that aren't wanting to unionize. You guys don't mention that. Because see, I started with nothing. Absolutely nothing. In fact, I started below nothing. And I started growing this little plumbing company with six employees to now we have over 300 employees. And back in 2009, you guys tried to unionize me. My guys were making money. They were getting paid more than the union halls were paying their plumbers. Our benefits were better. But because we started bidding jobs that were union jobs and winning those, union pipe fitters decided they were going to come after us. They would show up at my house. They'd be leaning up against my trucks. I'm not afraid of a physical confrontation. In fact, sometimes I look forward to it. I'm, that's not my problem. But when you're doing that to my employees, and then when, they, when that didn't work, they started picketing our job site, saying, shame on Mullen. Shame on Mullen. For what? For what? Because we were paying higher wages? Because we had better benefits and we wasn't requiring them to pay your guys' absorbent salaries? You talk about CEOs that are making all this money. And what do you make, Mr. O'Brien? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah, I know what you make because in 2019, your salary was, um, what is this, 193000 I'm sure you got some pay raises since then. Yeah, when I was a And the average UPS driver, the feeder driver, makes 35000 a year. That's and what do you bring That's to the inaccurate. Table? Hold on a second. That's inaccurate. State no, facts. I've got it right here. State facts. That's inaccurate. The average UPS feeder driver makes 35000 If you don't know your facts, then maybe you should. Oh, I, I know them because I negotiate the contract. So I say, I say one thing to you. What do you bring for that salary? What do I bring? Yeah, what, do you, what, do you, what job have you committed or have you, have you uh, uh, started? What job have you created? One job other than sucking the paycheck out of some other body, somebody else that you want to say that you're trying to provide because you're forcing them to pay dues? And no, then, we don't force them. Senator, you've asked the you're question. You're out of line. Let him answer Actually, the I question. Have it, and don't tell me I'm out, you out of line. line. Don't tell me I'm out of line. Well, you, you, you frame, don't tell me. I'm making a statement. You frame the statement. You need to shut your guy. mouth yeah. because you don't know you're what you're talking about. You're going to tell me to shut my mouth? Yes, I did. Hold it. Hold it. Tough guy. I'm not afraid of physical. Senator, hold it. But don't sit there and tell me I'm out of line. Senator. You made a statement, you asked the question. I didn't ask the question. You did it. You did. I answered question. the question. You asked the question. About how well, it was rhetorical. Made, let him answer. It was, rhetor it was a let, rhetorical Well, question. you may think it's rhetorical. It Sounded was rhetorical. to me like a question. Let him answer the question. I'm not yielding my time to him. So if you're going to let me keep my time, that's fine. You'll have your time. Let him. You ask Here's a question. question. He has so, a right to answer that. As far as my salary goes... My salary, if you follow me around, I walk, I actually look at this building. I bet you I work more hours than you do, twice that's, as many that's hours. That's impossible. But no, that is, that's true. Sir, you don't secondly, even know what hard work is. Secondly, you want to follow yeah. my schedule? Be, secondly, be, I'll do it in a follow. minute. Secondly, UPS feeder drivers, and you can quote uh, Carol Tomei, who quoted this, they make 93000 on the lower end. Some I of them make 150000 I said feeder drivers. Feeder drivers, tractor trailer drivers. Some of them make $150,000 per year. Some of them do. And I don't disagree with that. Most of them make over. Four, most of them, after you've been there four years, most of them make over a thousand. Uh, okay, most of them make over a hundred thousand. So reclaiming my time, I go back to the whole fact that, sir, you haven't created a job. We haven't. You haven't been there. You haven't. Sure, we have. You haven't. Sure, we have. Tell me one job that you created. What do you, What are you talking? Be specific. You're like, an employer. You no, we're not an employer. People? 
No, but you know it's funny. So, no, then, we, we hold create, on. Then, then, we then create opportunity. Jobs. We create opportunity because we Sir, hold that's, that's we not, hold greedy CEOs like yourself not, accountable. You call me a greedy CEO. Oh yeah, you are. You want to attack my salary? I'll attack yours. You're, what did ahead. you make? What did you make when you owned your company? When I made my company. I kept my salary down at about uh, fifty thousand a year because I invested every penny into it. Okay. All right. You mean you hid money? No, I didn't hide. Oh. oh. Hold on a second. Okay. Call he said that's out of line. You said right, I was out. We're even. We're, he's, even. He's, 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 we're not even. We're not even close to being even. You I think know. it's smart? You think you're funny? No, you're you, not. You think you're funny? No, I never said. I, did I smile? You frame. You frame your opening. Hold on, hold on. Let's. Uh, you frame your opening right. statement, no, saying you're a Senator. Tough guy. Continue, this, uh, this Senator. Is, please this continue is your behavior, statements. But sir, this is. A, I think. I think it's great that you're doing this because Me too. this shows their behavior on how they try to come in and no, organize a shop. No, no it's and just, they say about intimidation, and it's not about intimidation. This, it's they not show your behavior. Yep. Yeah, stay on the issue, please. The issue is if you're really for the employee. Then why are you against right to work? Why are you against private ballots? Okay. If you're really about the employee, let the employee make the choice. I'm not anti-union, but when you don't want to have a private ballot, that's not intimidating? That's not intimidating? Why wouldn't you want a private ballot? If that is intimidating the employee. If you don't want a right to work state, don't force somebody to, make, to pay dues to an organization they may not agree with. Don't force somebody to do something they don't want to do. That's called employee choice. If you want to be part of a union, God bless you, be part of a union. I have no issue with that. But don't sit up here and say that an employee is the one that intimidates their employer, their, or their employers are intimidating their employees not becoming a union. Okay, Senator, That's not thank accurate. you. Thank you very much, Senator Murray. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I actually would like to start by recognizing how much progress that we have made as a country in recovering from the pandemic and building a stronger and fairer economy. But there is still a lot of work left to do to make our economy work for everyone, which is why I was proud to introduce the Richard L. Trumka Protecting the Right to Organize Act again this year, along with Chair Sanders, because this bill will really help hold employers accountable when they violate labor law. I wanted to ask President Schuler, President Henry, President O'Brien, can each of you give me an example of how the PRO Act uh, would help workers organize? And President Schuler, I'll start with you. Thank you, Senator Murray, and thank you um, for the question, because I think what we're talking about, if we can all refocus, is, yes, the ability for workers to freely choose to form a union in their workplace, and when they do, to have the law on their side. And the PRO Act actually uh, would create real penalties for employers who violate the law, because I think that's what we're seeing now is once workers stand up and, and take the risk, and there is a lot of risk involved, it takes an act of courage to form a union these days because of the retaliation, the harassment, and the firing. Um, but when they do and they form a union successfully, um, if employers break the law along the way, they should be penalized with real financial penalties uh, instead of just a slap on the wrist. Because right now, companies are just, it's a cost of doing business. You know, they hire the union busting consultants and they just bake it into their business model. You know, so it, there's no deterrent for them to break the law. So the PRO Act would change that. Uh, the PRO Act also would have, uh, give workers access to the back pay, the reinstatement, um, kind of the notice and posting requirements to show other workers that taking the risk is worth it, that they're not going to be uh, penalized in a way that's going to hurt their livelihoods, which is what's happening right now. And right now you actually get a bigger fine for violating fishing laws in many states than you do uh, for busting unions. So, President Henry. Thank you so much, Senator Murray. In the case of Starbucks, if you take what President Schuler just outlined, uh, the hundreds of unfair labor practices that have been filed against Starbucks for closing stores, firing workers, uh, changing schedules, uh, targeting union leaders and pulling them into the trash alley behind the store and raking them over the coals about why they're public for the union, there would be penalties for all of those behaviors that we wouldn't have to wait over 14 months uh, to have a ruling on. And even as Starbucks had the most egregious violations issued from the NLRB just last week, 
The next morning, CEO Howard Schultz was on CNN saying the judge got it wrong and they intend to appeal. And the PRO Act will help speed up uh, the process as uh, we heard from Mr. Ring as needing a quicker process. And then the other thing the PRO Act does is for Crystal Orozco, uh, the fast food worker who I told the story about, it holds the joint employer accountable, which is a huge step forward for the four million fast food workers in this country that McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King would be held accountable for what happens to workers, just like they are for meat and potatoes and ketchup and napkins uh, of the franchisees. Thank you, and President Bryan. And I think my, my colleagues uh, in labor make some great points, but the one most important thing regarding organizing in the PRO Act that it would mandate that a collective bargaining agreement would happen sooner than later. I think right now it takes about 406 days um, from the initial start of the um, election to conclusion to get a first contract. And a lot of times um, the stall tactics that are utilized at the NLRB, um, the egregious violations along with some fines, but having teeth in, in a bill that would allow the workers who made the choice uh, to be unionized, to get a collective bargaining agreement. I think that's just as equally as important as well. Thank you very much. And I just have a, a few seconds left. And I just want to say that despite enacting the Equal Pay Act more than five decades ago, on average, women, including those who are working part-time or part of the year, earn only 77 cents for every dollar paid to men, resulting in a pay gap of $11,782 a year. And Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, say for the record, I'll be introducing the Paycheck Fairness Act again soon, uh, because I think um, as, as unions have been really helping lift women, this is something that is really important for all of us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Cassidy. I'm going to defer to Senator Murkowski, and she, I'm going to go vote as she asks her questions. Okay. Mr. Chair, um, Ranking Member, thank you. Uh, interesting conversation here this morning. I just wish that, I wish that we could have conversations about union versus non-union um, in, in a way and a manner that is, um, is not so acrimonious, not so hard, not so, so charged. I absolutely believe that it's important that we have unions. Um, uh, Alaska is a very strong uh, union state, uh, great workers, great contributors to, to our economy, um, and bringing good paying jobs. Um, we're in a tough place right now as a state. We have had 10 years of, of net out migration. Um, we are at the bottom of the stack when it comes to recovering from the pandemic. We are lowest or almost at the very bottom of, of GDP amongst states. And so we're, we're looking to, to make sure that we have an economy that is attractive to, to workers right now. I think we know that private sector unions thrive when the economy is growing, when the labor market is, is strong. Um, I, I look at it and say unions exist because there's jobs to do, and for there to be jobs, we need industry to be building things, producing things, providing services all, all across the country. And um, I want to recognize that not all union jobs are shaped by the private sector. At times, some of these jobs come down to decisions that are made back here, particularly in a state like Alaska, where thousands of, of really good paying jobs are, are hanging in the balance as we're waiting for a federal decision that could come later this week on, on the Willow Project. And it's not something that I'm going to ask those of you on the panel here to opine about, but just note for the record that every single union in the state of Alaska is supportive of, of this Willow Project and, and what it will provide. Um, so recognizing that, that some of what we're, we're, we're talking about here is, is enforcement um, but also just how do we find the workers with the skill sets necessary to be doing the jobs that we're, we're talking about. And I, I would ask um, in an open-ended question here what the unions are doing to respond to the challenges of workforce shortages like we're having here. Are there specific federal programs? 
And then I'm going to use my time to, to move to a second question. And, and, and this is just to note, we've got, uh, uh, we've got good, strong representation in the state from AFL-CIO, from, from Teamsters. Um, and, uh, and I have always said, we've got a role for union. We've got a role for non-union workforce across our state. Workers should have the right to choose if they want to, to join a union. Alaska is not a right to work state. But I would note that the PRO Act, which you all have mentioned frequently, would provide federal preemption for the 28 states with these laws. How do we reframe this discussion so that it's not an us versus them dynamic between union and non-union? That's a truly open-ended statement or question there. Um, and I'm not going to pick anybody to start, but I've given you two important things, I think. And you have a minute. 20 seconds. <laughs> well, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, Liz Schuler, AFL-CIO, and you're right. I, too, wish it didn't have to be so acrimonious, and it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, you think back to the National Labor Relations Act when it was passed in the 30s and the conditions. There were wildcat strikes. There were workers up in arms. Business actually wanted the National Labor Relations Act. They wanted unions back in the 30s to sort of calm things down, to provide predictability and certainty and a process where we could talk to each other and work things out. Um, fast forward to today, things are very much out of whack. Um, and uh, in terms of your first question, I, I would say we too are very interested in figuring out how all of this, uh, all these new jobs that are going to be coming in the clean energy economy and in chips and science and manufacturing uh, can be good high wage jobs with dignity and respect. Um, and we are used to dealing with this, right? In the labor movement, we've been training workers for over 100 years in partnership with our employers to provide predictability and certainty in a talent pipeline. No pun intended with Alaska, but it's essentially the, the labor movement can be the bridge and the center of gravity for uh, making sure we have that, that workforce that we need to tackle the projects of the future. And Senator Murkowski, we are working with you in trying to transform home care jobs all throughout the state of Alaska. These are poverty wage jobs done primarily by women of color in every zip code uh, in Alaska. And joining together in unions have allowed those jobs to become living wage jobs at an $18 an hour wage with health care and the beginning of a retirement for the first time in just across in Washington state. And so that's a very concrete way. I think that we can come together as working people and government together with employers to raise wages and create good jobs uh, all across the economy. Thank you. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, uh, Chairman mm -hmm. Sanders. Uh, and thank you for holding this hearing. Um, this topic is so important to me <clears throat> and people that I represent in um, the state of Wisconsin. Um, as President Biden implements programs authorized by the Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, I have been pleased that uh, he is following the will of Congress and ensuring that the money spent on those programs will support high quality American jobs. President Biden is delivering the message that we intend to make things in America again. That's right. uh, in Wisconsin, we've prided ourselves not just on the quality of the products we make, uh, like ships, engines, beer, and batteries, um, but also the quality of the jobs themselves, um, which often pay good wages and uh, offer generous benefits, and that we're hard won through collective bargaining. However, I'm disturbed by a trend that I'm seeing. This trend is illustrated by two battery production facilities in Fenimore and Portage, Wisconsin. The facilities are now owned by Energizer after the company acquired them in a 2018 merger with Spectrum that consolidated the battery market. The 600 workers at these facilities are Teamsters. Um, they are uh, President O'Brien's uh, Teamster members. In October, 
uh, Energizer requested that the Department of Energy use funding from the infrastructure law to support R&D into micro batteries so that American companies like Energizer can maintain a leadership position in battery manufacturing against foreign rivals in China. Just a few weeks later, Energizer notified the Teamsters at the two Wisconsin facilities of its plans to move these jobs to non-union facilities in the US and foreign facilities in Asia. It seems to me that when seeking support from the government, these billion dollar corporations talk up their American facilities and workers. All the while, some of these corporations, like Energizer, are making plans to move a union facility to a non-union state or a foreign country. I often hear from executives that these decisions are, they're just business, right? And that the company, or perhaps its well-compensated consultants, have calculated that closing a union facility will add value over the long term. After seeing the impact during the pandemic of our long supply chains and the costs associated with moving uh, work to low-wage foreign countries, I'm certain that these consultants have their math wrong. We need to change these corporate calculations, and it begins with increasing oversight of our federal labor and antitrust laws and our federal contracts. I hope that uh, Chairman Sanders will join me in that oversight. Um, because the greatest value that a company generates comes from the labor and the ingenuity of its workers. And unions provide the job security and wages necessary uh, for workers to develop the skills and the institutional knowledge that are the bedrock of innovation. The American people should not have to subsidize billion dollar corporations that ship jobs overseas or close union facilities just to add pennies to next quarter's earnings per share. So President O'Brien, I know that this issue is very important to you um, and your members. And I'd like to ask you to share a bit about the impact that these closures would have on your members and what we can do uh, to prevent companies from making such devastating miscalculations. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. And it, um, it's not just 600 members losing their job. It's 600 members with families losing their jobs, which is important. And you mentioned um, longevity, right? So some of these folks, and we've had the opportunity uh, to talk to them, and you know, we're trying to find solutions working uh, with the employer and their attorneys from the other side to say, what can we do to keep these middle class jobs here? Uh, some, some of the horror stories are people are going to lose their health care. Uh, they've been there so long, they don't have any other skills. Um, and their pension, you know, there's a lot of jobs out there that don't provide pensions. You'll hear a lot of people say, well, we have a retirement program, a 401k. I think if we looked at our 401ks over the last six months, I think 33% of your net worth was lost due to the market. So that's not an attainable uh, goal when you're 50 years old or 60 years old and you can't get your pension anymore. Um, what can we do? I, I think we have to, you know, revamp some of these laws, especially where companies like Energizer are closing down a union facility, seeking lower wages, lower conditions in non-union facilities in the United States, but also sending some of that, sending that work to India uh, where we could actually do and reinvest um, in these workers in this country. I think there's got to be some sort of checks and balances that don't allow corporations to do such things. So uh, I don't have the answer to that. You know, unfortunately, I, I don't pay attention to bottom line of, of balance sheets at this point with Energizer. I'm more concerned what's going to happen to those 600 uh, workers and their families moving forward. And I think we've got to collectively work together to try and find a solution to keep those jobs here. Thank you, Senator Bolin. Senator Marshall. Well, thank you, Chairman, and I'm honored to be here today. Welcome to all of our, our panel. Believe it or not, I grew up in a union town. I remember the local union sponsoring a baseball team. Uh, 
by the time I was old enough, probably 17, I was working out at the oil refinery, a, a high school college student, beside those union workers, and have nothing but good things to say about them. I was making $6 an hour, a great wage for a 17-year-old. The union workers were probably making 30. Um, I was doing the same job they were. I got some of the dirtier jobs. Certainly, I, I understand that, you know, the health needs. I, I, I mean, I figured out, I understood why they needed that union. Uh, my hometown, El Dorado, was in the suburbs basically of Wichita, uh, where two-thirds of the small airplanes are built in this country, built with union labor. I didn't know any different. I just thought that, you know, unions were, uh, they, they were figuring out. And it was, it was all working out just fine. Yesterday, met with the firefighters union. My dad was a firefighter. These folks are, uh, firefighters are getting cancer at a young age. And I understand that role of the union out there fighting to help them uh, you know, get proper compensation for that. I, I totally get it. I was proud to stand up and fight for my unions when there was the um, irresponsible vaccine mandates and my union workers. That's the only time the union workers ever complained to me was over this vaccine mandate. Um, otherwise, it, the, the process in Kansas seems to have a good relationship between management and unions. At the same time, franchises are, are home to Wichita as well. Wichita, Kansas, home of Pizza Hut, home of Freddy's, two very successful franchises as well. I can think of no other model that's helped minorities, women, and veterans have an opportunity to become small business people. So it's this balance that we're, we're trying to find. And I, I think of my model as a physician, above all, do no harm. And my question about the PRO Act is, does it do harm? Does it hurt one more than the other? So I'm going to turn to Mr. Ring and ask that, um, look, franchises are a huge part of our Kansas economy and have a very different employer model than other businesses. Can you elaborate exactly what would happen to the franchisor franchise, franchisee relationship if the PRO Act were enacted? Same with franchises and their workers. Sure, Senator. Um, the, the, the issue you raise is, uh, really comes to this question of the joint employer uh, standard, um, something that has been a debated uh, in labor law for a long time. Um, the, the standard was, was, uh, was in place for decades, and most of the United States and the franchise, franchise or model grew up under that, that standard. Um, before uh, the Obama era board uh, changed that standard and uh, made it much easier to, uh, to hold two employers responsible for the same workforce. Um, the, um, when, we were, when I was chairman, we issued a, a, a rule uh, through rulemaking to return the standard to what it had been. Um, and the, um, and we, we thought that was the right way to do it through a rule. Uh, we, we were able to solicit comments and get input from uh, all, all, all facets, all industries. Um, and currently, uh, the current NLRB is now uh, gonna, looking at changing that back again. The PRO Act would do um, even more harm, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of uh, the joint employer standard. It would essentially remove um, any impediments to a joint employer relationship and sim simply say that if you do business with another employer and you have any kind of reserve or, or um, uh, contractual interest uh, and control over that other business, you're a joint employer. Okay, um, okay we, I, I need to move on, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Mix, I wanted you to answer the question, but I'm gonna run out of time. Would, very briefly, would this harm the, the franchise model? Well, I think so, but more importantly, it would harm the status of the right to work status of Kansas. I mean, I was briefed before the hearing today to say that the PRO Act doesn't repeal right to work laws. It just allows for negotiation over union security agreements, which are basically the compulsion to pay dues or fees or lose your job. So it would make a radical difference. And then the idea of the joint employer, I mean, let's say that you have, you're a company that uses a landscaping company to mow your yard and you have control over when they show up. How do we determine whether or not they're now a joint employer as it relates to unionization? Right. Lots of questions about that. And, right. and to your franchise model, you're absolutely right about that. That's created more, uh, more millionaires in America than anything else, probably. Well, I appreciate the testimony. And, and Mr. Chairman, again, I would just conclude by saying 
in Kansas, we have a pretty good relationship going on that allows the franchise model, it allows the unions. I'm concerned when, when the federal government gets too involved. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I don't think it has to be one way or the other. I think my union workers, what they're most concerned about today is inflation and the safety and security of their families. And that's what my focus is going to be to help the union workers in America. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Marshall. Senator Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Cassidy for having this hearing. Thank you to our witnesses for joining us today. It is really great to have the presidents of three of the nation's largest unions together to discuss the important role that unions play in our economy. And I'm looking forward to working in this committee to advance priorities for working families in New Hampshire. And this hearing is a really important part of that effort. One big step we could take to help workers would be to pass the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. And I look forward to working with you and your members to get that done. I want to start with a question to you, Ms. Schuler. According to a recent report from the U.S. Government Accountability Office, women earn about 82 cents for every dollar that men earn. The Paycheck Fairness Act, led by Senator Murray, aims to eliminate this gender pay gap. Your written testimony highlights the fact that wages for women who are represented by a union are higher than their non-union counterparts. How have unions been successful in narrowing the gender pay gap? I always say if you want equal pay, join a union uh, because it is the data shows women do better. Uh, with collective bargaining, pay is transparent because that is one of the biggest issues, right, is that often we don't know we make less. Right. Um, so with a collective bargaining agreement, everyone knows what everybody makes and you make the same for, you know, depending on your, your skills and experience. Um, we also know that women have health care and retirement security which is such a big deal for women. Uh, particularly, we know they live longer, right? Um, and so we know that uh, when women come together with collective bargaining, they also have a mechanism to face down harassment and discrimination and to fight back without fear uh, because you can stand up and have your voice heard and not fear that you'll be fired because you have your union there to protect you. Uh, so I think overall we can we can fairly say that women do better when they're in unions. Well, I appreciate that. I still remember uh, talking with a constituent in a union hall. She had just finished her training uh, to become, I think it was an electrician, and she was talking about how uh, being supported by the union, trade by the union, um, enabled her to actually support her family on 40 hours a week and how proud she was of that. So um, thank you for the work you do. Mr. O'Brien, in New Hampshire, I frequently hear from small businesses that they struggle with workforce shortages and that they need more skilled workers. Last year, following advocacy, advocacy from me and my colleagues, the administration announced additional funding for programs that give high school students real work experience and help them make progress towards industry credentials. So can you discuss the impact of programs like these and the important role that unions play in them? Well, I think it's important that um, not everybody gets an opportunity to go to a four-year college. Right. So I think, you know, what we've been promoting, and I think collectively with, with um, yourself and, and many other uh, legislators like yourself around the country is promoting uh, in-school trainings for uh, apprenticeship programs, right. going to the high schools, talking to these folks, because I think we all have a concern that there's going to be a work a shortage with all this work coming up. But more importantly, when we get into these schools and create these programs, uh, we're able to educate um, the prospective union members uh, on what it is to be in a union, what it means, so they're getting you know a perspective on you know, what, why they have the wages, why they have the conditions, why they're going to be able to have a career and a middle class lifestyle. Um, but not only are we doing that on a high school level, last week alone, um, and I wish uh, Senator Mullins didn't run out of here, um, we created a thousand jobs partnering up with United Airlines, where we are taking uh, low wage earners that are entry level, giving them an opportunity through an apprenticeship program to better their wages, their benefits, but also to give them a career path to a higher middle class uh, living. So it's not just focusing on you know, the apprenticeship programs out of high school, but it's also partnering up with the employers to facilitate their needs, their employer, employees, um, to create these programs to give our members that much more opportunity and a better life. 
Well, thank you for that. And I want to follow up with Ms. Schuler on, on a theme you just hit. And it's a theme that uh, you discussed with Chair Sanders, too, as I understand it, Ms. Schuler. Companies can work collaboratively with unions to be more responsive to employer needs and spur innovation in workforce operations. In your written testimony, you say that there are employers who recognize that workers having a voice through a union is an asset, not a liability. What positive outcomes have these companies seen because of this collaboration? Uh, positive outcomes just like the ones Mr. O'Brien talked about. Absolutely. It is stability, predictability, and, uh, you know, having labor relations that are stable make perfect business sense. Yeah. And we've seen it over and over again when a company brings a union into the workplace that they have a mechanism to resolve disputes. They have less disruptions in the flow of work. And workers feel uh, confident to raise issues and not feel uh, intimidated. You think about the pandemic when nurses were in hospitals without PPE, they walked into the hospital with garbage bags right. and through their union and their voice walked out with PPE, right? So I think there's example after example that we're, we have predictable schedules, we have better wages and benefits when workers have a seat at the table and they can actually bargain uh, for, for their fair share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Senator Cassidy. Hey, thank you both. Thank you, Senator. I'm sorry. Um, Chairman Ring, I um, am concerned that NLRB seems to be putting their thumb on the side of the scale that is headed towards employees seeking to unionize, not all employees, just those seeking to unionize, as opposed to being a, a neutral arbiter, if you will. Uh, I, I would refer to this as a weaponization of their skills. Any comment upon that? Well, I will just say the NLRB um, should be a neutral arbiter of labor disputes. Um, we currently have, I think, a, a, a board that is very pro-union um, and a general counsel that is unabashedly pro-union um, and is, is pursuing a number of um, uh, initiatives that um, I, I think are putting the th thumb, so, thumb so the scale. This, so despite their legal, no one should be above the law, Despite their mandate under the law to be a neutral arbiter, um, you're describing a board and a general counsel who are not neutral arbiters. Is that a correct characterization? Well, I wouldn't say that they're they're uh, be being impartial to a particular facts, but I think they have a very very strong view of uh, uh, and a. Uh, par uh, uh, leaning towards unions. Yes. Scripture says, "Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth doth speak." Is their heart overflowing so that it is speaking in a certain fashion? Yeah, I think so, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, you also, in your testimony, uh, mentioned or in your written testimony, speak about the impact of the PRO Act upon independent contractors. The guy who's working for me and he's got a Lyft and an Uber, and whichever one gives him the best fee, he's going to be a Lyft or an Uber, you know, from 15 minutes to 15 minutes. The guy tells me he's clearing $500 a day. I said, like, you're clearing it? He goes, yeah, I'm clearing it after expenses. The guy's doing fantastic. Um, but theoretically, this would have a negative impact upon that. Is that too much of a statement? It would have an, yes, it would have an impact on that. Okay. Negative impact. So the guy making 500 bucks a day doing what he wishes it would now be under a more stringent set of guidelines because of the PRO Act. Correct. Mr. Mix? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you eliminate the designation of independent contractors, you see under the National Labor Relations Act, independent contractors can't be unionized, but employees can. So if you force everyone to be an employee, whether it be a truck driver at the port of Los Angeles or Long Beach, or whether it's an Uber driver or a Lyft driver, you make them, quote, employees, then there's a revenue uh, side of that, which is force union dues. Okay, got that. Um, Mr. Ring, uh, you, in your testimony, you also speak of current law precedent establishes that you can't do intermittent stoppages uh, or secondary strikes, but the PRO Act allows that to occur once more. Why were these originally outlawed, if you will? Well, they were part of the, I think, con congressional uh, uh, debate about where the balance of labor power should be between employers and, and unions. And I think that the, uh, the balance was that those types of job actions are really destructive to businesses. Um, and that and our law in this country has always been that if you're going to strike, you're going to strike once. You have to stay out and strike. 
uh, and not have intermittent types of uh, strikes. But it strikes me that doing intermittent and secondary would be a very a highly effective tool to bring a company to its knees. But if there's going to be collateral benefits from, as being described, clearly that would be collateral damages, right? That could affect a whole ripple effect. Mr. Mix, any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. That would open up a whole new avenue of, of labor protests and strikes, the potential strikes, where you go, you don't target the, the original target of the, of the operation, you target their customers, and you go to their place and shut them down, and the, the obligation so the is... the employees of those companies would be adversely affected absolutely. because their businesses could be brought to their knees, even though they have nothing to do with the primary. Absolutely. That was the, that was the intention of outlawing the secondary boycott. That's pretty clear. And um, I would just say, in, in, the, in this economy, with this supply chain issues, that could be devastating. Ms. Henry, let me ask you. Um, there's a picket line, Amazon, where somebody was using a bullhorn to harass workers going in. Would you condemn that? Senator, are you speaking of an imaginary example or no, a case a real that example. you know about? A real example where a person picketing outside an Amazon facility used a bullhorn to harass a woman as she walked in. And we've spoken about the consequences. We don't want employers harassing employees, period, end of story. But nor should it go the other way. Good for goose, good for gander. Would you agree with that? Well, I'd need to know specifics she was about using. This. He was using a bullhorn to scream at her. Yeah. There's, I've been on many picket line senators, and uh, we use bullhorns in order to communicate but with picketers. But if you're screaming at a particular person, I mean, that's a fairly straightforward, and it's a real-life example. Do you condemn that? But what if the— uh, I, I, I think you're going to dodge until we get there, so I'll leave that go. Um, okay. Um, lastly, Mr. Ring and— um, my chair will like this question. One of the things being raised is that it can take up to 400 days for a new uh, union to be certified. Um, and, um, uh, and you speak about how NRLB could be improved just by having them focus more and streamlining processes. Is, is, is that an issue that can be addressed by streamlining? I that did bother me. What, what, how would you comment on that? Yeah, no, I think I think that's that, that was the point of my testimony. I think the the while the board is off chasing various shiny objects that have nothing to do with collective bargaining or unionization, um, a lot of the the nuts and bolts of what the NLRB should be doing, like processing election petitions, uh, languish, and and the employees that are seeking to unionize are are. are adversely affected by that. So they vote for a union and it takes 400 days, but because the board is chasing a shiny object and not enforcing this order, that 400 days is allowed to occur, which is not, if you will, an indictment of the employer per se, as much as an indictment of the NLRB's uh, enforcement of that. Again, is that a correct characterization? Yes, it is. Thank you. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member. Um, let me just, before I get to my questions, I just want to maybe I'll turn to Ms. Schuler. Is there anything in that back and forth that we just had about some of the impacts of the PRO Act, especially around independent contractors? I'm curious, if you'd like to add to that, particularly with regard to how employers use this independent contractor situation to get out of um, their obligations, responsibilities to their employees? Exactly. I think it's a scare tactic. The PRO Act would do nothing to inhibit independent contracting when they're and it's when it's legitimate independent contracting right we're talking more about when workers are misclassified right um, employers want to abscond responsibility and and treat a worker as a contractor when really they're an employee um, and this pro act only applies to the nlra so we're talking about labor law we're not talking about any other kinds of you know protections and laws that are so it doesn't affect those um, and you know misclassification is running rampant uh, in our in our economy, and especially as we're looking toward the future of work, where people have to work two and three jobs now mm -hmm. to make a living because they're piecing together independent, you know, kind of contracting gig work. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. O'Brien. I want to ask you about um, uh, work job site job site safety. So union members understand that their union makes their job site safer. And knowing that they're safe at work, that their workplace is following best practices and um, has high standards gives people a sense of security that they're going to be safe on the job. So let's take the situation of Amazon warehouses. 
Um, a few years ago, the, um, NL, the National Employment Law Project and the Atwood Center in Minnesota, um, this is a community organization that works to build economic power amongst workers in the East African community in Minnesota. Um, they put together a joint report on the human costs at Amazon work, uh, warehouses in Minnesota, and they found that employees um, at the Amazon Minnesota warehouses stand a one in nine chance of being injured in a year and are more than twice as likely to get injured than those at non-Amazon warehouses. So, Mr. O'Brien, could you describe what you've seen as the differences in worker safety in unionized versus non-unionized warehouses and what the effect of unions are in terms of improving workplace safety? Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Senator. Um, so, you, you know we represent UPS, which is 360,000 uh, Teamster members nationwide, and they do the same exact job as the Amazon workers do uh, every single day with the exception that Amazon drivers are independent contractors, UPS drivers are direct employees. But we have mechanisms within the uh, collective bargaining agreement that uh, mandate both the union and the company to uh, work together on safety committees mm -hmm. uh, within those facilities to address safety concerns on a daily basis such each and every shift. And if there is no resolution, uh, there is a grievance procedure that will allow these workers and the company to um, uh, solve any worker safety issues or any uh, issues that may occur that could be a threat to our members getting home safe to their families at night. Conversely, when you go to Amazon, you do not have a mechanism, you do not have a safety committee, you do not have a grievance procedure, you do not have any, um, any, any platform to air your concerns on. And in some instances, and, and there's many charges at the NLRB, uh, where people have voiced their concerns and their safety, mm -hmm. um, they've been terminated and let go. So um, not only the unionized workforce, there's checks and balances uh, on both sides, um, but we are a pure example that in many, many situations, we work collectively with the employers to ensure that their investment of their employee and our uh, health and safety of our member uh, are running parallel with the same goals and objectives. So part of what's happening is that you've got to, I mean, who's going to know better than the employees that are there in the warehouse how to keep themselves safe? They're going to be able to make suggestions to the management and management and workers together come up with a solution that makes that workplace safer. That's what you're describing. Exactly. And um, I, did you happen to know, um, the, uh, do you have any data about what you see in terms of safety record in UPS warehouses? Or Yeah, I know, I know UPS has a, has, a, has a very clean record. I mean, right. look, like every workplace that's productivity driven, there's going to be issues, there's going to be injuries. But as long as those issues and injuries are, are dealt with and, and fixed, uh, I know that uh, Amazon has the highest rate of violations right. uh, in OSHA. I don't have the exact number, but they are uh, they are in first place, mm -hmm. so to speak, in a well, bad situation. And as you know, we found in Minnesota. I mean, one in nine people being injured in a year. You know, I mean, that, I mean that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, it goes to show, I think, that when you have good, you, when you have. You, when you have workers represented, you are going to have that good back and forth that allows people to be safer, and that's good for business, and that's good for the employee. Well, I think it's important, too, to notice that, you know, when, when you're training, collectively training uh, workers uh, to work safe, um, th that's a benefit for the company as well because there's longevity that's associated with working safe and showing up every day. Thank so you that, very much. So that's, that's an added plus as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Brunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, enjoyed our conversation from the other day, uh, Mr. O'Brien. Same here, sir. Yep. And um, I've been clear that uh, when it comes to uh, large corporations and the uh, ability to uh, effectively bargain with them, uh, there's uh, no replacement for a union. It's important. We also had the conversation knowing that I built my business up from the very grassroots level, and I think I made the statement I never could tell the difference between blue collar and white collar because we work together that well. That's why I've never had trouble hiring uh, people into the business that uh, three of my four kids uh, now run, along with a good young executive team. So these issues, this tug of war, especially as many industries have gotten very concentrated. Uh, 
you know, even to the, the issue that was the biggest deal to me was the high cost of health care. And uh, Senator Sanders and I have talked about that. It's a broken industry. Uh, larger and larger uh, companies control it. Even the practitioners, nurses and doctors, are having second thoughts about whether they want to invest all that time, especially doctors where you're post uh, undergrad, you're spending a minimum four to five years, especially up to nine. And uh, many think that they should still have their own business and increasingly are having to work for corporations that keep depressing their fees. So I understand the dynamic, but we I don't know that we talked about, and I'd like anyone to weigh in on it, would be that other end of the economy, uh, the gig economy, the independent contractor, and I know that gets to be a more difficult discussion. Most small businesses, my wife's had one for nearly over 40 years, and she's been an entrepreneur longer than I have. They make their living out of it. So that is their wage. And I'd just like you to weigh in on, uh, you know where I'm at when it comes to collective bargaining with large corporations. But then when you try to maybe collectively put individuals together and take that same philosophy, I don't know that that need is there. And I also would like your opinion of when it comes to that individual earning um, a living, uh, that is about like the blue collar worker in the sense that they're both trying to accomplish the same thing, pay the bills, not necessarily a return on investment. Mr. O'Brien, do you want to start with that? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And I appreciate uh, you taking the time on your schedule last week to meet. And I just want to know for the record that you were very supportive of our Teamster Rail Workers uh, and their plight to get sick time. And I believe because of um, people like yourself, we were able to achieve some of that stuff. Um, look, you're, you're, you, you've, I know your history pretty well. Um, and you're an employer that uh, does right by his people, from what I've heard, and that's commendable. Unfortunately, there's a lot of more employers that don't take that same philosophy, and the one good thing that um, I've learned from you, and you just stated here, that it's going to be a generational business, right? And it's going to provide opportunity, and you're going to provide those core values and um, uh direction to, to the next generation, which is great. Look, I don't think anybody's trying to impede on anybody's right to be an entrepreneur or to have their own business. Um, you know, that, that lip Uber model that Senator Cassidy described, the $500 a day, $500 a day does seem like a lot of money. But when you factor in, you know, expenses, no health care, no benefits, um, these workers are coming to us. We're not soliciting them. Um, but as far as the entrepreneurial stuff goes, I don't think we're looking at, at, to, to impede anybody's ability to be an entrepreneur, to have a small business. Most of the people that come to our organizations come to us for a reason or a violation or a grievance that they can't deal with their employer one-on-one. -on -one. We are not out there seeking you know, to destroy anybody's business. Look, I work with billion-dollar corporations like UPS and, and many others, the airline industry, and we collectively work together. Why? To create jobs, but also to uh, make their business as successful as possible. Because if their business is successful, our members are going to be successful. So I don't want anybody to think that you know, we're targeting a certain individual. Senator Mullen and I got into it pre pretty hard today. I don't condone going to someone's personal home if you've got an issue in the workplace. We don't condone that. We won't do it, okay? But, you know, on the same hand, if members, if people come to us want to be members of our union because their employers are not providing them health care, uh, stealing wages from them, not allowing them to have a voice in the workplace, and not protecting their safety, then we are extremely relevant in that process. Thank you. About out of time. Does anyone else want to briefly weigh in on that topic? I would just say for small business, I think it's um, just like doctors coming together in an, a medical association, um, you know, independent entrepreneurs coming together to, um, you know, get access to benefits at scale. Um, that's what we're talking about here is collectively improving our lot, whether you're in a union working in a hospital or if you're a small business person. But the PRO Act would not, as Sean said, discourage um, you know, independent contractors who are truly independent. I think what we're trying to get at is employers who are misclassifying their workers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Braun. Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much, uh, President Schuler, President Henry, President O'Brien, 
and Mr. Ring and Mr. Mix, thank you all for testifying today. I, I um, hope I could get to this today, but I may not. So if, I, if I'm not able to, I wanted to thank uh, President Henry for her great work on home and community-based services for people with disabilities and seniors and lifting up that workforce, uh, many of whom are trapped in low-wage work doing the most important work that we could ask anyone to do. So I, I wanted to state that for the record. I'm a strong supporter of the PRO Act um, for a lot of reasons, but I was thinking as, as you all were testifying and were taking questions and some, some uh, uh, references to our history, um, President Shuler, you made reference to the, the National Labor Relations Act and what the understanding was then. And as you know, as well as I do, most everybody in this room knows that the findings spoke directly to the free flow of commerce, that a determination was made by the United States Congress that if you have organizing, if organizing is strengthened, uh, you're going to enhance the free flow of commerce, better for workers, obviously, but better for business, too. We have gotten away from that, but it's still the law. It hasn't been repealed yet, despite efforts, I think, to do that. And I also think it's important to point out for the record that a lot of your unions, uh, all of your unions, on, on a regular basis, advocate for all workers. When you stand up for the minimum wage, your workers don't need an increase in the minimum wage di directly for them because you've already bargained and negotiated for that. But you're standing up for other workers who don't have a, have a, a raise in the minimum wage. When you advocated to protect health care, the, the Affordable Care Act and other health care fights, you have that because you bargained for it. A lot of people didn't have it, and you stood up for that. So I think unions do a hell of a lot more than just stand up for their own workers, as important as that is. I wanted to address an issue which hasn't, hasn't been raised. I was glad that Chairman Sanders uh, raised this um, question of uh, the, uh, the, the tax treatment of uh, activities by employers against unions to, in my judgment, union bust and then get a tax break for it, which is the state of American tax law right now. So in the same country where you can get a tax break for that, you can't, a corporation can't get a tax break for giving a campaign contribution, nor should they, but they, they can get a tax break if they hire a consultant to bust a union. That is perverse and wrong. But I wanted to move to another issue, which is employers using um, invasive technology and other practices to, um, to monitor what their workers are doing. Here's some of, the, some of the, uh, the examples of that. Employers are using these kinds of technologies to violate, monitor, and preempt uh, workers' right to organize. Amazon workers are being fired by bots, not by people, fired by bots. Um, and, and those same workers are left with few options to dispute employment decisions and to speak to a human manager to understand that how the decision was reached. Here's an administrative law judge in Buffalo with regard to Starbucks. This is a judge. This is, these aren't my words. These are the words of an administrative law judge. Starbucks used headsets to, quote, closely supervise, monitor, and create the impression that employees' union activities are under surveillance, unquote. So not just what workers are doing on the job, but even their union activities become the subject of that invasive and exploitive uh, surveillance. So I have a bill to, to do that. It's the Stop Spying Bosses Act. I can walk through the provisions of it, but I, I think it's more important uh, to ask um, either President Schuller, President O'Brien, or, or both, uh, do employers' invasive workplace surveillance tactics, some of which I itemize there, does that impact, do those efforts impact uh, workers' rights to organize? I'd say absolutely it impacts the right to organize because like in the Starbucks example, look, mo most American workers right now due to technology, especially at the UPSs, the Amazons of the world, they're basically held hostage by what they call a device like a dyad or, or, a, or a scanner, which monitors everything they, they do, not just scanning the products, but also, you know, keeping track of what they're doing, conversations, uh, everything else. So it is a very, very... Um, uh, um, evasive process, um, and it's intrusive. 
you know, to say the least. And, you know, knowing that someone's listening to your conversation, knowing that someone's watching everything you do, especially in a non-unionized, I mean, a, a, a non-union facility, you know, that is impeding your right to, to talk to your coworkers, to also, um, you know, and then they can utilize whatever lingo that you say and make their own determination and say, look, they're, you know, they're trying to form a union here, we're going to get rid of them. So it's very evasive, it's intrusive, um, and, and, you know, even, even in the unionized workforce, you know, which is important, like UPS, for instance, we're going into bargaining, one of our biggest issues, and we know that technology plays a factor in those jobs where, you know, they're monitored, told where to deliver a package and everything else. Now they want inward-facing cameras. So it's not just being evasive in an organizing drive, it's what we do to protect all workers from intrusion of their employer. President Schuler, I know we're out of, out of time, but anything quickly? Yeah, just that this is a bipartisan Sorry. issue. The surveillance of people in the workplace and privacy is a bipartisan issue. And we should be all afraid of predictive analytics and how the data is going to be used for all things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Markey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, this hearing is personal for me today. Workers across the country, across my home state of Massachusetts, are standing up for their rights as workers. My father, John Markey, was a union leader. He served as vice president of the United Electrical, Radio, and Machine Workers of America, Local 272 in South Boston, Massachusetts. He worked hard. He used to tell me, Eddie, you can't beg for your rights. You have to fight for them, which is why I'm so proud today, because I recognize my staff efforts to organize a union in my office. We're the first office in the United States Senate to do so. And I applaud these passionate, dedicated workers who are exercising their rights to organize through this fundamental, critical exercise in democracy. And I'm proud of my staff for embodying the commitment not to agonize, but to organize, uh, to set an example. And I recognize their effort to unionize, and I look forward to engaging with them and with the Congressional Workers Union. Uh, Ms. Henry, um, airport workers, they're unsung heroes. Um, they're overworked, they're underpaid, uh, they're the hidden figures uh, in our aviation history. They don't get to wear glamorous uniforms walking through the airport. Uh, and, uh, and they're concession workers, they're wheelchair attendants, they're ramp agents, they're baggage handlers. Uh, they do their job, and if they didn't, the airport would just have to shut down. They're essential. So could you talk about them and the need to have greater protections for them, uh, more rights, better wages, uh, better health care? Yes, Senator Markey, thank you so much. <clears throat> There's a million of those workers. They clean cabins, too, uh, and they have seven minutes to get into the airplane and clean the cabin for the turnaround before they have to get out. And workers all across this country are trying to join together in unions in order to have a voice on the job, to protect themselves, and to raise wages. Because in the 70s, every major airline contracted out these service jobs to contractors who employ them at minimum wage, no guaranteed hours, no health care benefits. And we have slowly but surely started to organize in the Midwest, along the two coasts, east and west, but we need every airport in this country for workers to be able to join together. And that's why the Good Jobs for Good Airports Act is so essential and is why we are fighting in the FAA reauthorization to establish a Service Contract Act standard for wages and conditions for all these workers. Because there, it should not be that contracted out jobs can't have the same wages and benefits with airlines that are earning record profits after having received uh, federal tax dollars to invest in their getting through uh, the pandemic. So I appreciate you leading on that legislation. And, and, and I appreciate the SEIU and the work which you are doing. Um, we just have to repay their sacrifices. You know, so many of us just Zoom to work. Yes. For two years. They were considered essential workers, had to show up every single day so that the system worked for the people who did go to airports. Uh, and they took that COVID home to their families. They saw it in disproportionate uh, percentages. And they were increasingly black, brown, immigrant, female, 
we know who they are, right? That's right. And they, they took the risk for all the rest of our families, and they just don't get rewarded in this system. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with you. Uh, and, and Mr. O'Brien, the problem of uh, companies skirting their pension obligations through bankruptcy is an important trend occurring in uh, our nation right now. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your perspective, any personal experiences you may know of, of how workers just are ultimately left behind when the bankruptcy is used as an exit route for a corporation. So as many people don't know that when these corporations you know, claim bankruptcy and they have a collective bargaining agreement, they get an obligation under the pension funds uh, to pay withdrawal liability. Pension funds are the last line in the creditors to uh, capture any money if, if there's any left at the end of the day. And the most recent one was the Boston Herald. I think you're familiar with that, where <clears throat> he had three private equity companies coming in uh, to um, bid on the bankruptcy of the Herald. And at the end of the day, uh, the pension fund ended up with like three cents on the dollar. And we are still obligated as a pension fund to make our payments regardless of the contributions. So I think um, we need to reform bankruptcy laws. And I think you know, under the Americans Reco Recovery Act of the Biden administration, we, we, we fixed a lot of those wrong, bad behavior by corporations who claimed bankruptcy and then pointed the fingers at union pension funds saying they were mismanaged. They weren't mismanaged. They were just last in line to get anything, if anything. So um, I think we need to work collectively to make sure that we have, uh, everybody gets their fair share, unfortunately, when a company goes in bankruptcy. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Markey. I believe Senator Luhan is on his way, but in the meantime, Senator Casey, Cassidy, you had uh, some additional questions? Yeah, so, um, uh, real quickly, by the way, there is common ground here, and Ms. Schuler, I totally agree with you on the issue of privacy, totally. Ms. Henry, um, I didn't, wasn't able to give you detail regarding that which I asked you if you had problems with, but there's a video of an April 2020 episode in which those striking outside of a Amazon warehouse were using a bullhorn, and a gentleman who was, quote, arguing with a female employee called her a gutter bitch, crackhead, and stupid. Do you condemn those remarks? You know, Senator, I'd like to see the video and comment on this specific issue. Mr. O'Brien, do you condemn those remarks? If someone, if someone is speaking out of turn, it doesn't represent the organization as a whole. Would I call a woman those names personally? No, I would not. Is it appropriate for someone, we're concerned about harassment of employees seeking to unionize. This suggests that there should be, it's valid to be concerned about uh, harassment of employees who seek not to unionize. I think I heard from you that it's inappropriate, that's more than I've heard, uh, inappropriate, and that it represents the union effort poorly. I would agree with that. I've, I've organized many companies, been on many picking lines myself, and there's been hostile situations, and they work both ways. So to- So we could condemn it both ways. You could condemn it both ways, yes. So, thank you, I agree with that. And Ms. Schuler, would you find that offensive and should be condemned? I think what we're talking about is workers' frustration, and workers are looking no, for a voice. No, we're talking about somebody calling someone a gutter bitch, crackhead, and stupid. I don't use that language. I wouldn't encourage yeah. anyone else to. And is it wrong? I think name calling is not what we're about in the labor movement. We're about giving workers a voice. Is it wrong? To, to call people this? names, of course. Thank you. <laughs> I yield. Now, by the way, I'm sorry. My staff will shoot me if I don't get this right. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record letters from stakeholders opposing the PRO Act and to insert a Reuters article which references the video regarding the strikers' harassment of those continuing to work, of which I just referred to. Without objection. Uh, let me just say a few words. First of all, thank all of our panelists for what I thought was a, a good discussion. Um, Senator Cassidy talks about an incident that took place where profane words were used, and I think most of us would think that's unacceptable. But I would hope at the same time, we would also consider it to be unacceptable that heads of corporations go up to workers and say, you vote for this union, we're gonna take your job to China or to Mexico, or we're gonna shut down. I would hope that Senator Cassidy and others would 
understand that that is not only unacceptable behavior, but illegal behavior. And I think at the end of the day, what are we talking about, really? We're talking about an America today where there is more income and wealth inequality than any time in history, where a few people on top have extraordinary power, while so many millions of people are struggling to put food on the table, struggling to keep their families alive economically. And what common sense suggests, you don't have to be the president of a union or the former head of the NLRB to understand this, is that if a worker alone is in trouble, he or she does not have a lot of power to ask for better wages. If a worker, and this goes on all over America, has a terrible schedule, and the employer says, you got to come in on Sunday, but that's my daughter's birthday. Sorry, that's what you got to do. What power does an individual worker to say, no, you're destroying my family life? All that unions are about is not complicated, is people coming together to fight for a contract which guarantees them certain basic rights. Mr. Employer, you can't have me come in on Sunday. That's not in the contract. Mr. Employer, you have to pay me the wage that we agreed to. Mr. Employer, you can't fire me arbitrarily because your cousin wants to take the job. That's all that unions do. They bring working people together in an extremely difficult moment in our history to fight for decent wages, and union wages are higher than non-union wages, fight for better benefits, and no question about it, union benefits far better than non-union worker benefits, fight for things like pensions, which are almost unheard of now in non-union companies. So we got to struggle. There's a class war going on, whether we want to recognize it or not. People on top have the money, they have the power, they are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to prevent ordinary workers from coming together to fight for dignity. So I want to applaud, thank all of our panelists for being here, applaud our trade union leaders uh, for fighting for uh, American workers. And with that, uh, let me state that this is the end of our hearing today. And uh, for any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, March 22nd at 5 p.m. And finally, I ask unanimous consent to enter in the record a statement from the National Education Association. So ordered, uh, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you.